A few months back, we took a look at a 2005 gaming PC that I built from parts I acquired over the years, and it turned out to be a great system for games around the time and was very fun to build and bench. Since making the video, I've wanted to throw some upgrades at it to see how much more it could do, and well, thanks to a generous hardware donation from a viewer of the channel, we're finally going to be revisiting the system and finding out if we can make it ready for 2006. If you haven't already, I suggest you take a look at my first video on this build if you want to know most of the background behind the system and what parts we used before. With that, let's jump right into all of the upgrades. By 2006, having more than one CPU core was starting to become the norm as a lot more options became available in the form of AMD's Windsor Athlon 64X2s and Intel's Core 2 Duo, so it only makes sense to use a dual core chip for this upgrade. Now unfortunately I can't use a Windsor CPU on this platform, but thanks to a donation from an awesome viewer of the channel, I was able to go for the next best thing. This is an AMD Octron 180, and it's one of the faster dual cores available for this platform. It comes clocked at 2.4GHz, which is 200MHz higher than the 3700 Plus we were using before, and with the extra core this should equate to a fantastic uplift in CPU performance. And when we get to overclocking the parts, well, uh, that's where things are going to get a little crazy. The rated TDP of the chip does jump to 110 watts as expected, but I compensated for this with a small cooler upgrade. Gone are the mismatched sticks of RAM that we were using before, and in goes a beautiful 2x1GB kit of OCZ EV Platinum RAM rated for DDR500 speeds, which was donated along with the CPU by that awesome viewer, so thanks again. They're a pale gold in color and quite sexy if you ask me. This was known to be amongst the best DDR RAM that money could buy around the time, and are good for up to 550MHz with the right tuning. It's good to know that the RAM speed never ends. And to take advantage of all this dual core power, I swapped the dapper EVGA 7800 GTX with the rather utilitarian looking, but much faster Radeon X1900 XTX running a Thermaltake Duorb cooler. This card was one of the kings of performance in early 2006, and remained a very high-end option up until the release of Nvidia's DirectX 10 capable 8800 GTX. Even after the fact, it remained a really strong card for DirectX 9 thanks to ATI's well-aging R500 architecture and its incredible brute force pixel shading capability. These traits made it one of the fastest DirectX 9 cards ever made, and it will be a tremendous upgrade over that 7800 GTX. As for what hasn't changed, I didn't see any reason to ditch the Antec Sonata case as it was already very good, the power supply got a slight upgrade with that older EVGA 600W being swapped for a newer gold rated unit. As I mentioned before, I changed the all aluminum Athlon 64 stock cooler with a 4 heat pipe copper and aluminum one from a Phenom 2, and the SSD is the same given that it was already being bottlenecked by the SATA 1 speeds. So in the end, only three parts differ that are important for this video, but believe me when I say that, that was all we needed to make a world of a difference for the system. Okay, let's talk overclocking. Now in my last video I did some mild tuning to the parts, but we're going to try to push the envelope a little more this time around. After a while of tuning, I brought the CPU FSB up to 250MHz, which after factoring in the 12x multiplier makes for a nice and rounded 3GHz clock speed on both cores, and has a memory running right at its rated speed of 500MHz effective. Now I'm not going to lie, I'm not really the best person to be tuning Athlon 64s as I don't have that much experience with them. If it were someone a little more acquainted with these chips, I'm sure they would be able to push the setup much farther, but this should still give us a respectable boost over the stock clocks. And I mean, even with the better cooler, it was getting a little bit too hot for my liking. Last time the system responded really well to the overclock, so even if this is just a 25% boost, I don't think it's out of the question to expect some good scaling here as well, but this time the graphics card may hold us back a bit, even though it's much faster than the old one. Speaking of which, I tried to tune the X1900 XTX as well, but unfortunately the card would get extremely unstable, even with some conservative overclocks, and at lower settings the performance boost was negligible. I tried messing with the card's voltage as well, but it just didn't seem to help much. Again, I think I'll just chalk this up to a lack of experience on my part. I hope to learn more about tuning these cards in the future, and make a dedicated video showing off what an overclocked X1900 can do, but for now I just stuck to the card's default settings for our stock and overclocked benchmarks. Now let's talk what we're going to be testing. This time we're featuring the largest game suite of any of my videos so far, with 13 games in total. Five of them are games returning from the previous video, and the other eight are new for the system, so it's a pretty overhauled test suite that's much more well-rounded in my opinion. This should give us an even better overview on how the system stacks up compared to before, and I've also added some classics that really should have been in the first video. We are using different settings for some of the old games, so some of the results won't be apples to apples between this video and the first one, but I'll include retested results from the old setup so we can compare. Like before, all games were tested using the 1280x1024 resolution. 
Also, to get my numbers for the frame rate charts, I completed each benchmark three times and then averaged the results out. And for the frame time charts, I selected the run that produced the tightest frame times of the three. Finally, I'll show a slide on screen with the full system specs plus the graphics drivers we used. And with that, we have 13 games to test on three setups, so let's get to it. First game up is Doom 3, and I tested it using the Demo 1 time demo at the Ultra preset with 4xAA and 16xAF. Now here the old setup achieved 69 frames per second on average, and on the new setup frame rates rose 38% to 95. Overclocked performance was the same, and this is a pretty clear example of a GPU bottleneck. Frame times were pretty poor on the old setup, but things are a lot better on the new one as expected. That overclock setup could shine with a more powerful GPU, but I wanted to keep things period correct in this video, so expect this kind of overclock scaling in some of the more GPU bound games. Still, we were able to observe a solid performance boost on the new system, but trust me, you haven't seen anything yet. Next up is Half-Life 2, and here I used the high settings along with 4xAA and 16xAF, and I tested using my standard 75 second run of some gameplay around the canals. The old setup scored 73 frames per second, with the new setup 30% faster at 95 and overclocked at 64% faster at an impressive 120. Frame times were good on all of the setups, with the only thing to note on the old setup being some small swings throughout the whole run. Also there were two large spikes in the middle of the benchmark for all of them, but that was about it. This game is much less GPU bound, so we're actually able to reap the rewards of the overclock setup, which was nice to see. Next up we have Fear, the system killer of 2005. I benched the game with the built-in benchmark and the max settings with 4x FSAA and 16x AF. The old setup averages 48 frames per second, with the new setup jumping up 25% to 60 and when overclocked it's 40% faster at 67. I did observe a decent amount of stutter in all the setups, but that's normal to see with Fear's benchmark. The frame time performance was noticeably worse on the old setup as it sees a lot more variance, particularly during the water section and end of the benchmark. It's a decent result for the system and we saw a good amount of improvement with the new parts and overclock. Now on to Battlefield 2, and we tested using 60 seconds of gameplay with the high preset and no AA. I did have some issues getting consistent runs out of the game, but since I've averaged out the results from 3 runs, we should have a decent idea of how it performs. The old setup put down 54 frames per second on average, which sees a 50% boost to 81 with the new setup, and a 70% increase to 92 when overclocked. There is a little bit of micro stutter on all the setups, but as expected the old config sees the most amount of swings. The new parts seem to give a pretty massive uplift right off the bat in this game, and the overclock scaling was very solid here as well. Unfortunately I can't say the same about this next game, Splinter Cell Chaos Theory. I used Hardware OC's standalone benchmark tool for testing with Shader Model 3.0, HDR, and no AA. The old setup scores 63 frames per second here, and moving on to the new parts, there is a nice 46% uplift to 92, but when overclocked, the performance is almost indistinguishable from stock. Looking at the frame time graph, it's much of the same thing, despite the overclock we're seeing almost no gains, which again stinks of a GPU bottleneck to me. However, overclock or not, a 46% improvement in average frame rate over the old setup is great to see, and I'll take it. Per a member's request on my Discord server, we're testing 2006's Prey next, and I stuck with the high settings, no AA, and 16xAF. For the bench, I measured a quick 30 second run of some gameplay in the first level, and I'm just gonna save you the trouble, all of the setups were virtually identical in performance here, scoring around 60 FPS during my run. This comes down to Prey having a 60 FPS cap, and this can't be increased as the speed of the game would go up as well. In order to fully saturate these cards and get below that 60 FPS mark, you'd likely have to raise the settings and resolution even higher, but I decided to just leave it be as this is my first time testing this game. There was a very minor improvement to frame times with the new parts and when overclocked, but it hardly affected the gameplay. For what it's worth, you're more or less going to have the same experience on all these setups. Now we have the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, and I tested with the high preset, HDR, and no AA. Also, I used a 60 second run walking around a settlement to get my numbers here. The old config managed 39 frames per second on average. With the improved parts, we see a 28% jump to 50, and overclocked, it's 36% jump to 53. Frame times looked very solid aside from some moderate swings throughout the run, which did see a bit of improvement with the new parts. Overall, the new setup doesn't distance itself very much from the old one in this game, but it's still a respectable result. Let's move on to Company of Heroes, and I tested with a 145 second run of the built-in benchmark at the high settings and no AA. The old setup put down 54 frames per second here, with the new parts bringing this up by 59% to 86, and overclock this becomes a 67% increase to 90. 
Frame times were a bit micro stuttery on all of the setups, but this seems to be typical of this benchmark. Additionally, the old setup has some large stutters around the end of the run, and this was repeatable between tests. Next we've got World in Conflict, and I didn't go crazy with the settings here, just picking the medium preset with no AA. I also used a 50 second run of the built-in benchmark to test it. The old config manages a measly 20 frames per second here, and this rises by 80% to 35 with the new setup. When overclocked, the new setup is a whopping 125% faster than the old one at 45 FPS, which is pretty crazy. Frame times are all over the place with the old setup, and it's clear to see that the game was a bit too much for it. On the better parts, they're much improved, and we see another large uplift with the overclock. All in all, the better components actually gave the system a fighting chance in this game. Let's now look at everyone's favorite system killer, Crisis. I tested the game with the built-in benchmark at the medium preset and no AA. The old setup is only able to eke out 17 frames per second here, and with the new parts there's an incredible 106% uplift to 35. When overclocked, performance was pretty much the same as stock, but with a small improvement to the frame times. Speaking of which, frame times were a little inconsistent on all the setups, but when overclocked the new config sees the best results as expected. Now you might be asking why there's such a massive difference between the old and new setup in this game, and this mainly comes down to the 7800 GTX being completely shader bound in this game, and it tends to see very poor performance at the medium settings. I've explained this in more detail in other videos, but in short, the X1900's GPU and architecture is a lot better equipped for more complex and demanding shader code, which is why you see such a huge difference. You'll notice this trend especially with these later games. Devil May Cry 4 is next on the list, and I tested with the high preset as well as 4x AA, and also used the first 60 seconds of the built-in benchmark to get the numbers. The old setup starts at 44 frames per second on average, and with the new one we see a 61% uplift to 71. When overclocked, our averages were just about the same again, so we're still running into a limit with that X1900. Frame times looked pretty rough on the old setup as it's constantly stuttering throughout the whole run, but the new setup almost completely eliminates this and overclocked and improves on the frame times even more. Second to last game is Far Cry 2, and I used the Ranch Small benchmark along with the medium preset, no AA, and no blue. The old config only coughed up 19 frames per second on average here, and with the new parts, performance was doubled to 38, along with far better frame times. When overclocked, we see a 132% increase over the old setup to 44. Frame times were a mess on the old config, with plenty of hard stops riddling the first 20 seconds of the benchmark. On the upgrade system, there's an incredible jump across the board and all of that terrible stuttering was gone. Overall, it's another good showing for the system, and it's nice to see a game benefit so much from the newer parts. Final game up is 2009's Stalker Call of Pripyat. We're testing using the standalone benchmarking tool with the medium preset, enhanced full dynamic lighting, and no AA. On the older setup we score 22 frames per second, and on the new parts this jumps up 73% to 38, and overclocked it's pretty much the same at 39. The old setup has quite a lot of issues with stutter during the whole benchmark, but it's a lot better with the newer parts. Also all the setups had some large stutter at the beginning of the benchmark, which was repeatable, but that was about it. It's another strong performance from the improved system, and once again brought a lot of playability to a game that was pretty slow before. Now what might be the most interesting metric is the average doubt results, so let's take a look at how the setup stacked up in all the games tested. Of course the old system is at the bottom with 45 FPS average doubt, and with the new config at stock settings there's a 42% increase overall to 64 FPS. Now as to be expected the new setup when overclocked is the fastest of the bunch at 70 FPS, or 55% up from the old system so not too much faster than stock settings. On the whole, these results aren't exactly what I was expecting, but we'll talk more about this as the video comes to a close. Before that, I wanted to get in one synthetic benchmark for CPU performance, and like last video I picked Cinebench 2003. On the old setup we got a CPU score of 311 CB with its Athlon 64 3700+, and on the stock Optron 180 we got 339 CB on the single core test, and 637 on multi-core. When the new setup is overclocked, there's a 25% increase in both single and multi-core tests, finally some CPU performance scaling, and it's more or less perfect as 25% was how much we increased the core clock. So it's conclusion time. 
Is this PC ready for 2006 after all the upgrades? Well, yeah, of course, and a lot more than that too. In the older games, scaling between the old and new setups at stock settings isn't that amazing, but in the newer and more demanding titles, we're able to reap the rewards of the fast graphics card and dual-core CPU, with some even seeing doubled performance. But it's definitely not perfect, and turned out to be more limited in certain areas than I thought. For one, I definitely wasn't expecting the X1900 to hold back the CPU as much, since it's a very fast DirectX 9 graphics card, but I guess that's just a testament to how insane the CPU is. Above all else, it shows that the Optron 180 has a very high GPU performance ceiling, especially when overclocked. It would have been a very nice future-proof CPU for the time, and it's possible you could have ridden it out into the DirectX 10 era with this chip as long as you upgraded the graphics card, which is very impressive. On the whole, I think it's safe to say that the system has been taken to the next level. What was a very decent 2005 gaming PC became a pretty crazy 2006 build that's capable of doing excellent in games of its time, and even able to get through some titles of the late 2000s goes to show how quickly PC hardware was advancing at the time, as there's just about a one year gap between the old and new here and the performance difference was staggering in a lot of cases. Before I end the video, I wanted to give a shout out to TamW for his hardware donation. This video wouldn't have been possible without it, so thank you very very much. It was really fun to mess around with the mid 2000s system again, and there may be another build video in the not so distant future, so stick around if you're interested. With that, my voice is worn out from this long video, so I'm done talking. Thanks for sticking around to the end of the video, and I'll see you all in the next one.